Who made it out today? Give yourselves a hand. Right? And for those of you who are at home, I'm so proud of you for saying, no, we need to be safe and stay at home and watch online and engage in worship with our whole hearts. Way to go. <laughs> um, this morning, uh, we're, we get to do this uh, really lovely thing. And, you know, all fall we've been trying to uh, one of the things that we heard clearly God saying to us as a church is we need to gather around the word, around scripture. And uh, without, uh, so we, what we've been trying to do is actually model how God wants to speak to us through his word. And it's great to research. It is great to look up the footnotes and things, but there's something that God is inviting us into to learn and believe and to trust that we can read scripture and God will speak to us. And so we've been, but one of the things that we've been saying about that is that we need to practice. It's not like any other muscle, like any other skill, like any other sport or musical instrument. Things improve, we get into a groove and we learn how to do it as we practice it. And one of the things that we've been sensing as a church is that we need to do it together. So, a few times this fall, and we're going to do it again this morning, we're going to walk through a scripture, and then uh, all I want to invite you to do right now is trust that the Holy Spirit, uh, who, who loves to take God's word and highlight it for you, make it real for you, make it personal for you, uh, just allow God to make something jump out to you. So, what does that look like? Uh, Many times people when are waiting for some, like, like suddenly a word drops down from the sky and you're looking at it and you can't miss it. Perhaps that will happen. More likely, you'll go, huh, and you'll hear something and go, I wonder why I'm noticing that. That's very likely God's spirit going, poking you on the shoulder and saying, hey, pay attention. I wanted you to hear this part. Don't worry about understanding it all right now. Don't worry about uh, figuring it all out. Listen to have God have something jump out at you. And then just sit with that. It could be one word. It could be a phrase. It could be something that bothers you. And that's okay. Pay attention to the times where you feel like, huh, well, I don't know what I think about that. That is very likely God inviting you to say, let's talk about that together, right? So, would you grab your pew Bibles if you're at home, you can, or you can open up your phone. We're going to be looking at NIV, though, so it might be worth. Um, and I did put the scripture up there for those of people at home in case they're ru rushing from their, um, you know. So let's just imagine people at home with a fire burning, and they're wrapped up. They've got their coffee in a blanket. And for them, we're going to put something on the screen. But what I'd like you to do is actually look at the Bible, okay, um, in front of you. So page 820. Yes, the Bible has page numbers to help you find things so that you don't have to memorize it. We're going to, in the Pew Bible, it's, uh, it says under sowing generously. This is what I'm going to do. You find the page now and then just put your finger in it or your hand upon it. I'm going to read it. I just want to invite you to close your eyes and just listen. And then after you've listened once, I want to invite you to go back and read the passage, okay? So you've found the page, hopefully, page 820. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. And just close your eyes if you want to and just listen. This is Paul writing. He's writing to the church at Corinth. He's writing to them. He has been in the last chapter writing about a famine that's happening in, in Jerusalem where, where one of the sister churches is. And he's been talking to them about the financial needs that they have because they're starving and what the rest of the churches can do about it. But listen to this passage. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man or woman should give what they have decided in their hearts to give, not reluctantly, or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound 
in every good work. As it is written, he was scattered abroad his gifts to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. We're going to stop there. Okay, take a second before you start reading it. What phrase, what word, what thought jumped out to you as I read? Take note of that for a second. Would you turn to somebody else? No, we're going to do this first. Go back and read it now. Read it again. If nothing jumped out the first time, read it. We're going to do verses 6 to 11. And just what jumped out to you? you're still reading keep going I'm just gonna start giving directions so what I want you to do is with there's no pressure if the only thing that jumped out to you was as you were listening you were thinking did I turn off the gas you know for the stove or you know that's okay uh, but and if you're thinking I need something super wise to share if they're gonna Drew's gonna ask me to share to somebody else that's not true just turn to somebody around you if you have to move a little bit in your pew that's okay uh, to find somebody, but just what jumped out to you? And, you know, if you have other thoughts about it, great, but if it's just like, this is the phrase that jumped out to me, just share that. What word? So, and I'll, I'll give you an example just so you know what I'm asking you to do. For me, it was the word all. He kept saying, I'll, God will do this completely all, and he will be generous all, and, and that was just jumping out to me, how, how Paul is using the word all over and over again doesn't have to be any deeper than that okay so I'm setting the bar pretty there you go I'm sure you have many more profound things to share but move around your pews say hi to somebody share something try to get a couple people together go 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 we're gonna take about two minutes not very long two minutes Awesome, I still hear whisperings. We'll give you another couple seconds. Awesome. I'll let Andrew bring us back up because you'll see some new faces up here. Uh, we're going to continue the conversation, and you're like, what kind of transition is this? Had us, had us jump into scripture, and now Rhonda and Terry are up here. Um, you will see how this all weaves together. Uh, because we want to start with the word. We want to start with scripture. And before, um, sometimes we present the ideas, and then we give you space to think about them and wrestle with them. Um, but we wanted to start with scripture for you to think about them 
And now we're going to have a chance to hear from Terry. This is Terry. He's wearing a few hats this morning. He's Terry, who's just awesome. He is Terry, who um, loves The Chosen, and he's going to be going to The Chosen this afternoon. If anyone's looking for a, 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 an afternoon, cozy afternoon, some of us are hitting up the uh, movie theater tonight and watching The Chosen. Um, Terry is an incredible leader in this place, um, and he uh, gives a lot of his time and energy and thoughts and prayers to this church and to the United Church in general. And he also wears the hat of our treasurer. And um, as you probably guessed from the scripture, there's some stuff in the scripture about money and giving. See how we did that? Yeah. And we spend a lot of time as a church, um, like Drew said, practicing looking at different muscles, looking at different ways to connect with God. We want to break down how do we how do we use scripture? For, but for some reason, when it comes to giving and money and church and that relationship, it gets a little tricky. So we tend to avoid talking about money at church. But God has a lot to say about um, generosity and giving, as you already read this morning. So Terry carries a great amount of information and wisdom. And he invests a lot of time thinking about that as a church community. Um, so we decided that there's a lot of like information that people don't know um, about how that relationship and how, how money and offerings and stuff works. So part of it is just going to be a little Q&A with Terry. Um, so I'm going to just start off um, by saying, asking, these were a couple questions that we discovered that not everyone necessarily knows the answer to. So join us. We were going to have fireside chats, kind of fits, but we decided to just sit on stools instead. Um, so Terry, after that long intro, um, can you help us understand how much money does the church get from the United Church of Canada? So that is our denomination. How much money does Calvary get to help us run things? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very interesting question, and the amount, and the, uh, the answer is nothing. Uh, we, all, all of Cavalry's funding comes from, comes from you. Uh, a very small amount, less than 2% uh, for 2022 so far, uh, comes from the use of the building, where we we rented the building out for, for use. In fact, Calvary receives, Calvary receives an assessment from the United Church Canada that's based on our, our overall revenue the church receives from all of its sources. Uh, and under the United Church of Canada's new assessment formula, uh, that's 4.5% of our net revenue. So we don't get anything from the United Church Canada. We give to the United Church Canada. Um, so Canada, uh, Calvary has applied on occasion uh, for the occasional grant from the United Church, uh, from the United Church of Canada Foundation, Western Ontario Waterways Regional Council, United Possibilities Fund, or UP Fund, uh, from the uh, Waterloo Presbytery Extension Council. And these one-time grants are geared to the specific project. Calvary's most recent grant in 2020 was to, um, to help develop uh, our youth ministry. Um. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so we actually don't receive money from the denomination or from our um, umbrella. Uh, we actually give. So, so when, so we're giving and we call it offerings. Um, what is all covered in our offerings then, Terry? Yeah, so the, I think the first thing we should ask about this question is whose offerings are these? Uh, where did the offerings come from? After all, everything we have is a gift from God. God owns everything. Our own earnings are a blessing from God, and we as individuals are his stewards. Uh, John Wesley put it this way, when the possessor of heaven and earth brought you into being and placed you on this world, he placed you here not as a proprietor, but a steward. We often act... Often we act as, as if the goal for our church's spending lies in, in what it can accomplish. So if you were to ask, why are, where are we getting weight? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I even wrote this out so I wouldn't stumble. Anyway, why are we giving all this money? 
I might point to the to the list of items in the budget. You know, people gave money to uh, uh, to to the, the the minister and the staff to heat and power the building to pay for repairs to the building. Um, to build the outdoor classroom, provide for that DTK program. But that accomplishment-based focused mentality doesn't really square with the fact that God is not wanting for money and his purposes are, are much bigger than merely what our church's budget can accomplish. His purpose for our church's budget is that um, in our church's faithfulness, that in our risk-taking obedience, we show off and reveal how amazing he is. I realize that's a tall order, but our church's budget can do that in, in three ways, these three ways. As we give money to the church, our faithfulness as individuals proclaims God as better than our money and his command to give as more delightful than our desire to get. As we invest our church's money in God's work, we deliberate about which investments best align with the values God gives us in Scripture. Often making investments, the world says, are foolhardy. Once again, we're showing off how good and trustworthy God is. As God chooses to bless those investments, he shows himself to be a God of power, of mercy, and a God who keeps his promises. God often works through our limitations. And, and I admit, at times, I've looked at Calvary's financial situation and sort of looked at the bottom line and the limitations therein and said to myself, oh, if we could all just give an extra 5%, look at how much we could do. But I think how often in Scripture, it's the limitations that reveal the glory of God. Consider Gideon's tiny army, David's single slingshot, uh, Jesus' clueless disciples. Faithfulness is both aggressive in the risks it takes and the content with the limits God ordains. This is our church treasure. Pretty awesome, hey? More than just the and, budgets and, I, and the, the templates and, and how he makes that work. This is Terry's heart as he brings into navigating a church and helping us figure out when, yeah, we often... The numbers don't match often. <laughs> and uh, so thank you, Terry. Um, so similarly, you know, you're sitting down, you got your spreadsheets and the whole other language that sometimes you like to tell me about. And I go, I don't know. Is that English? <laughs> what do you need me to do, Terry? <laughs> and uh, but how, how do you how do we as a church set our budget? Kind of walk us through taking some of that heart but some of the pieces of our kind of our limitations, our realities um, here at Calvary. How does, what does that look like? So like a lot of matters we engage in at Calvary, the budget process starts with scripture. There are a lot of scripture examples, uh, but one of my favorites is starting point is Matthew 6, 9, 13. You might know it as the Lord's Prayer. Um, it talks about give us our daily bread, for example as one part. Uh, we start off remembering that stewardship is managing God's treasure in God's way for God's purpose and always for God's glory. We begin life with our hands wide open and nothing in them. As we mature, by the grace of God, he allows certain things to be placed in our possession. None of them are under our ownership. He owns everything in heaven and earth. It's all his. So we've been given one main task, to be a good steward of what he has entrusted to you. Nothing less, nothing more. God owns it all. During budgeting, we must remember that the, the faithfulness of our congregation is something only God can fully measure. God's encouragement to us can be found in 2 Corinthians 8 um, and, and verse 8. God is more than ready to overwhelm you with every form of grace so that you will have more than enough of everything, every moment and in every way. He will make you overflow with abundance in every good thing you do. So the limits God has put around Calvary's budget are perfect. The pace at which he is growing the congregation's maturity is perfect. His plan for, God's, uh, for Calvary's future is perfect. 
He will perfectly accomplish his plans for our congregation. There is a wonderful hope in that promise. So on the expense side, budgeters look at staff, programs, missions, men outreach, and what I like to call operations. We need to honor the vulnerable relationship between church and staff. That connection's not like your typical employer-employee relationship. If you think of your own employer, and then you would think of yourself and your relationship with that employer, and then you think of our staff and the relationship they have with their employer, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a different type of relationship that we need to, we need to graciously honor. In terms of operations, what do, what do the congregants want from a facility? We generally assume that they want to attend the church to build social capital, to get inspiration for life, to teach their kids how to live, to connect with God. That's, because, that's tricky because we can forget God's focus. If a church is oriented towards faithfulness, it is oriented towards the problem God wants to solve, the job God wants Calvary to do. Operations should free the congregation for ministry. Operations should serve ministry. Consequently, even administration facilities is pastoral in nature. We manage this budget to help the congregation to become better mirrors of God's character and better messengers of God's gospel. Awesome. Thanks, Terry. And, um, and so intentionally, we asked Terry to kind of kind of share some of the big picture um, questions and stuff. And, and if you come to uh, AGMs or at any time and you want to hear more specifics about the nuts and bolts and that sort of thing, please, Terry would love to chat with you um, about that. But we wanted to hear kind of some heart and some, some philosophy. So, um, so we went out for lunch a while ago as chatting about this and um, you had a couple kind of gold nuggets that I wanted you to, to share. Um, and uh, so can you share a little bit about um, some of the learning of what um, we as Christians do as a church, do we want to do um, when money comes in either personally or as a church congregation? Yeah, so th this is where we often get confused. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we are stewards of the blessings God has given us. Uh, in our lives, we often get the order of our stewardship out of sequence. At least I think we do. I have. We often distribute those blessings in the order of savings, spending, and giving. Those three in that order, sometimes. But even worse, we may order these as spending, savings, and giving. We get in trouble with this when we spend more than we are blessed with, such that there's nothing left for savings and giving. The more faithful order of the, those three is giving, savings, and then spending. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus from Acts 20, 35. It is more blessed to give than to receive. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7 to 18, it says, you must decide in your heart how much to give, and don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. I think we just read that, did we not? Yes. It's worth repeating. And, and God generously will provide your need. Um, a fellow by the name of Darshan, Darshan Goshwin, Goshwin, I don't know, I got his name completely wrong, recently wrote, it is the joy and love that we extend to others that brings true happiness or union with God. When we give, we reap the joy of seeing a bright smile, laughter, tears of joy, gratitude for life. We know that if people give just a little more of their time, skills, knowledge, wisdom, compassion, wealth, and love, the world will be a more peaceful and healthier place. You may have heard an acronym for joy. Joy comes when you Put Jesus first, others second, and yourself last. Um, so we've been intentionally talking about generosity. Dave did a, a big picture um, kind of look at that last week. And then we wanted to zero in specifically, what does that mean for a relationship with the church um, here at Calvary? And uh, we want to we be a church, and we are a church that declares God's generosity, and therefore we get to be generous. Um, and so there's been some beautiful testimonies that, that has um, 
has shown itself over the years, um, even in the shorter time that I've, I've been here. It's been pretty amazing to see God um, stepping in and changing trajectories of, of what we think our year end would look like. Um, so um, I asked Terry to reflect, what's one testimony to kind of encourage us to be like, okay, we're talking about money, this is awkward, and, you know, and then we start going down that trail of like, oh, they're really just saying through this all they want me to give more, and, you know, all those kind of scripts that go through our head, but really we want to focus on God and who God is and his generosity, and, and, and out of that, we have a response, yes, but um, let's just celebrate some of the things that God has, has done. You want to share a testimony with us this morning to close us off? Yeah, so I started when I would, when, when Ronald asked this question, I, 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 I dove back into the annual reports from the last few years, and I realized, okay, there's, there's too much. I'd be going on for days <laughs> trying, to, trying to highlight the examples of the things that Calvary has, has done and been involved with. But the one specific one for me happened a few years ago. Um, uh, it's an example of God's provision and goodness. Uh, happened during, uh, at the end of uh, 2016. And in February, uh, Calvary received a significant bequeath. Uh, during the year, the, the trend behaved traditionally as far as the flow of income goes. And in December, Calvary received three significant contributions from individuals uh, of approximately $48,000, and uh, that ended up in a surplus for 2016 at $32,000. Uh, so at the AGM, it was addressed uh, to, to, to figure out, the congregation wanted to decide what we were going to do about that, the, the $32,000. So what was decided was to set it aside and ensure it funded specific items, such as youth development, providing camp experiences for youth where needed. So we set up, so we pulled that out of the bucket that, could, you know, that holds our general operating fund. And we set that aside and we specifically, as a congregation, gave that away to those specific, uh, specific items. Um, and that's pretty much now drained. <laughs> But it was held specifically for that so we could track and see where that was, where that was going. And I, and I think that illustrates the heart and faithfulness of Calvary. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Terry. Let's uh, thank Terry not just for sharing his thoughts, but for the amount of work he does and Wendy as well. Awesome. So as we... As we continue to worship, I know that was like, okay, we started off with scripture and generosity and then did some talking on this and what, and there is, there is a call for us to, to be a, in partnership with this generous God. And um, I know we don't pass the plate anymore. <laughs> and so we really do uh, have to encourage you to think and pray. We wanted to create time this morning for you to pause and go out of you, God, who are generous. How would you like me to respond? And so just again, practically, um, you can talk to Terry about that. You can head to our website um, and encourage you to, if you're one of those people who are like, oh, I just kind of always forget. There is a really great thing called PAR, and it just comes out of your bank account on its own, and it's glorious. <laughs> um, and there's lots of different practical ways that you can do it. But more, more than that, will you create some space to reflect on that scripture, reflect on some of those thoughts? Um, so let's, uh, let's stand and, and ask God to lead us individually and as a church to be our vision, to guide us with our time, with our resources, so that we can continue to do what God wants to do in this place.
Okay, don't look at the clock, <laughs> because there's an important piece. It, it is remarkable to me. So uh, we talked about this several months ago, about how God was saying, like, you know, you haven't, you need to talk about giving. You need to talk about finances. It's not right to talk about my goodness and my grace without talking about response. And this is always a tricky one, and, and, and like Rhonda said it a few times, it's easy to get offended, it's easy to go, Ugh. it's easy to go, like, people are always asking me for money. Why? And there's a reason. And the reason is that Jesus says right from the very beginning, there's a tug of war. There is a spiritual tug of war between our possessions and the one who wants to possess us. And we need to understand that there's a tug of war going on so that we recognize that when we're holding on to something other than God first, we're not able to hold on to all that God has for us. If it was pure investment, which you know, everybody who knows me knows I totally understand finances, right? <laughs> Imagine God is on this side of the ledger. Infinite riches for us. Imagine this is out what we can do. Right? But we hold on to this. And what's going on? It's not about the stuff. It's about who we trust. And that's why it's a deal. That's why Jesus talks about money more than any other thing, including prayer in Scripture. Because trust is at the heartbeat of joy, of hope, of peace. So I, I just want to unpack that a little bit this morning with the few minutes we have left. Uh, d originally, Dave and I were supposed to share a message together, and then Dave had too much to talk about, about generosity, Terry pared himself down significantly because he thinks about it a lot. So I recognize that you would love to spend all day here with me to talk about this, but I want to just walk us through a few things today. 
And we can unpack it more another time. But it's worth it for us to do this because the tug of war that's going on in you perhaps right now is like when we were looking at scripture. If there's a discomfort in you, it's possibly that God is making you uncomfortable because he has so much more for you. And the thing that's making you uncomfortable is that he's poking you on the shoulder and saying, hey, you know that thing that you're holding on to? And this is about money, but it's about anything. You know, if you're holding on to something too tight, it's likely you're missing out on what God has for you. So, if you're feeling uncomfortable already, give yourself some grace. That means that you are actually sensing God's presence moving in your life. Right? Isn't that good? If you're feeling awkward or like, oh, I don't like this, relax. It means that God is starting to show you that he has something even better for you. So, Here's how we're going to walk through, and I'm going to try to be as efficient as possible. I promise you will get home for dinner. <laughs> I'm going to read some statements. We're going to throw them up there. They're called declarations. You got that? I want you to read them with me. Yeah, they're in a big box now. Oh, I'm... Oh. <laughs> People online must go, where did Drew go? He's <laughs> the rapture happened. All right. Would you say these with me? I am generous because I trust God will work with what I give. It's easy for me to give and not control what happens to my gifts. It's easy for me to receive from others. I see it as God's generosity and desire to bless and fill my heart. I love to look for ways to be generous to others. I get excited about giving because I know what God will do. Are you feeling uncomfortable now? <laughs> Some of you are saying, this is my summary of what we just read in, in 2 Corinthians. Are you feeling uncomfortable now? Is there maybe a spot in your heart that God is saying, I have so much more to give you? So let's start with this. God loves a cheerful giver because God is a cheerful giver. When Paul writes to the churches about giving, he writes, and so to us, when we're talking about giving, it's because God knows that if we're feeling in any way uncomfortable about any of those things, it's because we're missing out, we're not trusting, we haven't experienced yet the fullness of God's desire to bless us. Philippians 2, have you received, and it goes through a list of love, comfort, joy, compassion, fellowship, then make my joy complete by being the same as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to hold on to, but made him, emptied himself and gave himself to us. He became a servant to us. Uh, becoming like us in our, in our lives. He offered all that he was and surrendered himself even unto death, even unto death on the cross. Therefore, God raised him and seated him in the heavenly places, giving him the name that is above all names. Do we understand? Jesus gave himself completely for us, to bless us to free us, to deliver us. And God, in response, raises Christ from the dead, seats him in the heavenly realms, gives him the name that is above all names. God is giving in the very impact and relationship that we have here. Number two, Luke 10.10. 10. John, John is uh, writing about Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for his friends. And then he says, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. God is a God of abundance who comes to us to give. Philippians 4.13, Paul is saying, I have learned the secret of being joyful or comfortable or happy, depending on the version, in all circumstances, in want and in plenty. And he said, what's the secret? What's the secret, Paul, that you've learned to be content in all circumstances? Well, the secret is this. God 
will provide for my needs because he has riches in glory. If I have little, God will meet me there. If I have much, God will meet me there. God is a God who longs to give. And we'll just put up that slide, first slide. Slide one, please. God is always and ever trying to forgive, figure out how to give you more. That's the heart of generosity. I believe that that's, that is financial as well as healing, restoration, love, and compassion. God wants to give us more because God, by his nature, is a cheerful giver. And when God gives us more, he wants us to be freely giving. He wants us to cheerfully give as we cheerfully receive. It's like being in a truck and showing up in a missions place where you have a whole bunch of abundance and, and you pull into this village and you start going here and there's joy as the, you keep reaching into the truck and there's more to give out. God loves a cheerful giver. It's the joy of giving out of the resources of heaven and not the little that we have. Psalm 103, I won't do it now, but... Read through Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. And then David spends the entire psalm talking about all that God does for him. Okay, number two. So why is it a struggle? Why is this difficult? In the Second Corinthians scripture we read, Paul is saying, it's a heart thing. You must decide in each of you in your heart how much to give, is what Paul says. He says, I'm leaving this, God is leaving this in your choice realm. It matters what you, is going on in your heart. And so he's not going to force you to give, but being free to give frees you up to also receive. It's a deliberate practice with a promise attached. When you have much or little, and yet you determine your heart to say, God, how can I give? God starts to work in us to free us up. And God says that he will bless us. Let me just walk through this. See, God knows that the bridge between what we have and what he has is our heart. I talked about this with spirit, soul, and body, but I won't get into that today. There's a heart thing going on. That is the tug of war you were feeling, the discomfort. And the beautiful thing is that God is saying, figure out what's going on in your heart when you think about giving. If you're feeling Grinchish, it's likely that there's something in your heart that is keeping you from receiving all that God is trying to give you of his love, of his grace, of his mercy. God is more concerned about our hearts than he is about the giving, but the giving matters because he's concerned about our hearts. If you go to Malachi, which is the classic tithing passage in Malachi 3.10, he says, uh, Malachi, who's he's like a bit of a ch -ch -ch in the face kind of guy, he says, you've been robbing God. Bring everything, bring your tithes into the storehouses, he says. Like, give all of your gifts, not just the little. Don't just give a little bit. Give all that you have to God, and then you will not be robbing God. He's just talking about that tug of war. Are you holding stuff back? It matters because it's a heart thing, and God cares about your heart. God desires you to be free to give. He loves a cheerful giver. So this is the thing. And this is the reason that I'm totally uncomfortable talking about money, and yet I know we need to. It is the best heart assessment of how your heart is with God. When we talk about giving and you feel uncomfortable, likely God is wanting to point out something in your heart that is a place where he can teach you to trust him more, lean on him more, <laughs> God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need 
and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides for the farmer and the bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. This is what God is doing. He will provide and increase resources for you because he loves to see you cheerfully give because it looks like him, because your heart is aligned with his heart. And when you have a heart that is open to receiving from God, he, like that truck image, he can just keep giving you to give away. And the great thing is that as he gives to you, it blesses you as well. Now, I know some of you are already thinking in your heads, it's 10 after 11, when's he gonna shut up? No, no, I'm just joking. Uh, some of you are already thinking like, but that can be abused. When you start thinking about God wanting to give generously, people will then start saying like, God, give me a Rolex. God, give me a Tesla or two. You know, like, like when do you stop that? But again, it's about the heart, right? God loves a cheerful giver. <laughs> Not a, it doesn't say God loves a cheerful getter. Do you know what I mean? And here's, this is the problem, and this is why we're going after this this morning as we're heading into Christmas. Probably the question that you've been asking yourself at times is how much do I need to give? If you're asking how much can I get away with not giving, there's probably a heart thing going on that God wants to say, that you, you don't know how good I am. If you've been thinking like, oh, like, how much do I need to do to look generous? Well, that's you controlling this instead of God saying, God, what can I do? Here's one thing I do. Um, and I gotta say, like, one of the other reasons this is uncomfortable for me is because I feel like I, you know, like Terry is such a beautiful resourcer, gifter, generous guy who practices it. Dave is one of the most generous guys I know. I'm just me. I work on this, but it's not natural to me. My dad was an insurance guy. And we only learned about keeping everything, not giving it away, right? <laughs> um, so it's not natural for me, but this is one of the things I do. I'm working on my heart. And so I ask God, God, would you show me people that you want to be generous with? And then when God puts somebody on my heart, and then I say, God, I don't really, I don't think I have free resources to give to this person. I've learned that God isn't concerned about me giving it right away. God is inviting me into this conversation where he says, I want to be generous to this person. And I say, God, I've got nothing to give, and, which, isn't, which isn't necessarily true, but that's how I feel. And, and then he says, well, why don't you talk to me and start asking me to give you something to give away? God is inviting us into a conversation where we say, God, you care about this person. You want to be generous with them. I'm praying for them. God, would you bless them? And then God starts talking to me about how I can free up some money to give. Or sometimes God surprises me and gives me something extra so I can give it away. The whole thing about giving isn't a means like look at your bank account and give, give it away. The thing is that he's inviting you into a conversation to become generous, to enjoy his generosity and say, God, can I be part of that? That's where we want to get to. So how do I practice giving? We're on the home stretch. You're so glad you came this morning through the snow for this, aren't you? <laughs> Tithing. Tithing is simply a practice of giving in, throughout church history. It is, uh, tithing has been considered 10%. There's arguments about, is that 10% of my total money coming in, or is that 10% of once the government's taken their part off, or is that like 10% of the extra that I have? Terry did it beautifully. Are you giving, saving, spending? Is that what it was? 
Tithing is a spiritual practice. Like reading scripture, like anything else, practicing being generous usually happens because we practice regularly. Exercising, you look better when you do it regularly instead of once a year on January 2nd. <laughs> right? All of these muscles are all about God working on our heart to get it bigger and bigger instead of grinchier and grinchier to give. And so tithing is a simple way of regularly practicing, saying, God, out of the abundance that you've given me, thank you. What can I do to be generous like you? And I pra I've practiced, uh, so here's, uh, the first time I heard about tithing, I was 16. I was at youth camp. We had a youth camp reunion last week. Was kids sitting over there. Picture me sitting over there at 16. And then the offering plate went around, and the guy beside me who went to camp with me and was the same age as me got out two 20s and put them on the plate. I said, what are you doing? <laughs> he said, well, I worked last week, and this is 10% of what I made last week, and so I'm putting it on the plate. He said, you don't even go to this church. This isn't even your church. He said, well, that's tithing. I practice this regularly. I thought he was stupid. But then God started working on my heart and saying, the practice of giving is what I'm like. That's what I've learned over the years. And so I practice and I fail, but I keep practicing giving regularly, weekly, and also saying, God, how can I be more generous? Who can I bless? God, would you, when I don't feel like I have something, will you provide? So I want to invite you into this now. Would you just bring up those declarations again? Would you just pray with me? I'm going to invite the band to come up. We're going to finish with some worship. Because the reason this is difficult, because giving is really surrender, isn't it? Surrender is hard because it's letting go of control and saying, God, this is yours. How can I use it with you? Surrender is about saying, God, here is all that I have and all that I am. I want you to be part of it. I want you to have a say. And I want to practice becoming a cheerful giver. So let me ask you these questions as we pray. Do I trust God to provide for me? Because God is a provider first and foremost. Do I trust that God is working intentionally to bless me? Do I trust God to work through what I give? Whether you have a quarter to give or a quarter of a million to give, are you willing to let God take it and deal with it instead of you? Are you willing to let go of control and fear of not having enough or fear for what's coming next and be faithful? God, I will worship and I will give you my gifts. And do I let his generosity bless and fill my heart? As you look at those, would you make those uh, declarations a prayer for you right now? Would you maybe even consider starting to declare them over your life? Not because you are there, but because that's a target to shoot for. I am generous because I trust what God will work with what I give. You might want to make it grammatically better. It is easy for me to give and not control what happens to my gifts. You know what I find with my declarations when God teaches me something that he's working on? When I memorize something like that, every time I come across my, it, I do, this doesn't feel easy to give at all, I find myself going, it is easy to give <laughs> and not control it. It's easy for me to receive from others. I see it as God's generosity and desire. Some of us love to give and don't love to receive. But we receive from a cheerful God who loves to give so that we can give. I love to look for ways to be generous to others. Would you pray those right now as we begin to worship?